so exciting to be here with all of you today. It's really an honor and a pleasure. We have a great program for today. Um, mazel tov to everybody finishing the Masechet. Um, it's very exciting. Mazel tov to all those who aren't finishing the Masechet but are here to join us and celebrate before our pre-Pesach. Um, I want to start with our dedications for today's Siyum. Um, our Siyum is dedicated by Allison and Akiva Shapiro in honor of their daughter Meira's completion of Masech Psachim and her dedication to Daf Yomi. So Masal Tov to you. And by Abigail Gordon in honor of her daughters, Sipora, whose love of learning and dedication to Daf Yomi inspired me to start this journey in the first place. And Adira, my Pesach baby, who got a head start in her Talmud learning as she grew inside me. May your lives always be full of Torah learning and commitment. May you continue to know and learn from and with inspirational female scholars like those in the Hadron community, it's my great honor to learn with them and with you. Um, I wanna just say a few thank yous before we start. One is thank you to Sivia Torsky for her sponsorship of Masechet Psachim, um, both in memory, of her or in memory of her father and in honor of her grandson's bar mitzvah and particularly in honor of Shoshana Baker who volunteers hours and hours of her time to Hadron and is always pushing always working to move Hadron forward. So thank you, Shoshana. Thank you to Sivia. Um, I wanna at this point move into thanking Maggie, Maggie Sandler for being behind me on every single project. Um, she's a real talent in design and marketing and creative ideas and tech support and anything and everything that I need. So thanks for being my right-hand woman and for helping make Hadron run perfectly. Um, and particularly, I know it's not, it hasn't been the easiest year with quarantine and all that, and you've pulled through and uh, closures and everything. So thank you. And thank you to Serene Shanus and Harold Triber for the sponsorship of our next Masechet Shkalim. Um, our next Masechet is 21 days. So we will meet back here in three weeks. You're all invited to another Siyum. And um, if anyone wants to sponsor the next Masechet, you can already contact us because it's around the corner. And if you haven't yet joined our circle of friends, we have a huge circle of friends. If you're part of Hadron, you wanna join the circle of friends, please do so. All the details are on our website and you can help us with our continued work. Um, okay, we're gonna start with our final DAF. We were lucky we have a kind of short DAF. So um, we're gonna start at the bottom of Kuf Chaf Amibet at the bottom. Hapigu v'hanotal metamei tayadaim. It doesn't sound like the most interesting of topics, but you'll see as always, always take it off and make it interesting. So pigul and notar, before we even get started, we need to get some basics. What is pigul? What is notar? So pigul is when you, uh, Cohen has an intent when he's doing the sacrifice and he thinks that while, for instance, he's slaughtering the animal, that he's going to burn it on the altar at the wrong time or he's going to sprinkle the blood at the wrong time. That's what we call pigul. It's when the Kohen can mess up with just having the wrong intent, just in his mind, that already can mess up a korban. Notal is when you leave over the meat beyond the designated time. We've already learned in the Masechet a number of times, the different sacrifices, they have different amounts of time which, in which the meat is left to be eaten. So pigul and notar, according to the Mishnah, mitameya tayadaim. What does this mean? This is a whole different topic, which is if you have pigul or notar meat, and then you touch it, it makes your hands tame. Now, normally tuma doesn't work that way. Tuma is your whole body, but the rabbis said that hands can become tame from various things for all different reasons. We're not going to get into it now, but for pigul and notar, it was specifically to deter people from getting to this situation. If you're a kohen and you're serving in the temple, and all of a sudden you touch something that makes you tame, it's gonna be a pain in the neck. You're gonna to have to go and purify and all that. So you wanna basically stay away from that kind of thing. So therefore the rabbi said, we're gonna make certain things tame and so that it's a deterrent for the koanim to make sure to avoid this kind of situation. So here we're gonna start with the Gemara on this. Rav Huna v'Rav Chista, chad amar mishum chashdei kehuna. One said it's because of we're suspect of koanim. It's because we're worried about lazy kohanim. One said, what's the requisite amount that causes this, that causes this meat to, there has to be always with everything, there's a requisite amount. If you had a teeny, right, we're coming in on Pesach, where Pesach is chametz, any little amount. Okay, maybe 
Um, Rabbi Panita will get to that in her talk about why it's such a small amount, I'm not sure. But in any case, normally in order for something to have significance, it has to have a certain requisite amount. So the rabbis said, well, either Rav Hun or Rav Chista, we don't know who said what, one of them said, you need an olive bulk of meat in order for it to, if you touch something small of that, not matame yadayim. Hadamar kebetza, one said a kebetza. So now we have this, okay, so one said this, one said that, one said this, one said that. Now the Gemara is going to try to make order of it. Chad tane apigul, v'chad tane anotar. Oh, by the way, it wasn't that they disagreed about this. It was actually that they were each talking about different things. One of them was referring to the pigul issue, and one of them was referring to the notar issue. Man ditane apigul, so now we have to understand what's the connection. The one who was talking about pigul said, mishum chashkei kehuna, because how does pigul happen? It happens when a Kohen decides, I want to mess up someone's korban, or maybe he was just lax and wasn't focused enough. And we all know how hard it is to focus, but he all of a sudden his head, but basically we're concerned it was a good opportunity, and I wouldn't say in a negative way, where a Kohen could basically come along and, and mess up people's sacrifices. There's a whole debate, we'll get to this when we get to Zvachim, about, well, does the Kohen have to compensate the person, let's say, I'm supposed to bring a sin offering. The coin messes it up. Now I have to go buy a new animal. But still, even if he does compensate me, I still, it's a pain for me. And the coin could kind of mess up my sacrifice by doing this. By the way, you could also mess it up without telling me. And then my sacrifice never really goes through. So you really have to worry about coining who might do this. Manditane anotar, the one who says notar, is Mishum Atzleikuna. Why Atzleikuna? Because they're lazy, right? What's notar? Notar is you didn't eat it in the proper time. You didn't make sure, let's say you can't eat that much meat, but share it with somebody else. Find someone else to eat your meat. Don't leave it over. This is what we call, you know, lazy koni. Chad amar kezayit v'chad amar kebetza. Manda amar kezayit ki isuro. Manda amar kebetza ki tumato. Now we have to take kezayit and kebetza. Kezayit and kebetza are keywords that, that link into other sugyot that we've seen in the past. So what are these? So ke, the question here becomes, what is the problem here with the pigle and the no time? Now, pigle is something that generally, pigle is an issue when you, it's really, the problem is number one, you disqualify the sacrifice, but the issue becomes you get current when you eat the meat that was pigle. So because of that, the question is, are these issues food related issues? Because it has to do with eating it. And once we get into food related issues, we're going to put it in the category of then what's the amount that's important? The requisite amount is the same requisite amount that we use for food, which is a kezayit. Kezayit is generally the amount used for food. That's why on Pesach, we are going to eat a kezayit of matzah, although I'm not going to get into the whole thing with the shirim and how much and the people who eat double the amount and all that. I'm not going to go there. But manda amar, so kezayit ki isuro, because they look at, it's true, the coin's not eating the meat. He's just touching it with his hands. But the issue is that the whole pigle problem is a problem of eating. It's eating meat that became pigle. So we know is a measurement used when it comes to food becoming impure. It needs to be, then there's a debate. We always go back to this debate. Is in order to pass on impurity, does it need to be a kibetza, the size of an egg, which is double the size of an olive? Or is it even to become tame itself it needs? So since we're talking about tumat yadayim, and the whole topic is tuma, right? So we're, we're crossing over between two different categories here. There's a food issue of eating it, and then there's what the rabbis instituted, which is tuma. So the question is, do we go by the food or do we go by the tuma? So that's why we have these different opinions, and each one kind of, again, we said it was lazy, it was suspect koanim, so that all matched up with pigal and notar. And then the measurements match up with how they, where they categorize this issue. New Mishnah, last Mishnah of the pair. Berach, very, very exciting. Berach berkat pesach patar et shel zevach. Berach et shel zevach lo patar et shel pesach. Divrei Rabbi Yishmael. It sounds like we went back into bracha. We're talking about blessings here. So it says, if you make a blessing on the korban pesach, now we have to go back to something we learned a while ago, which is on the night of pesach or on the day of Yudalit even, on the 14th of Nisan during the afternoon, they would bring not only Korban Pesach, they would also bring Korban Chagiga. If you remember, we learned that toast vote, if you were with me, that um, some people say we don't actually, right? It's a question. Do you use both Tavshilin on the Seder this year? Because 
the Chagiga they couldn't bring on a year like this year where it falls on Shabbat. And Tosfa said, anyway, you do it, even though, right, normally um, on this kind of year, we wouldn't actually bring the Korban Chagiga, right? The two, the egg and the, and the shank bone are remembering the Pesach and the Chagiga. In any case, that's an aside. But the point is that there's a blessing to be said on the, the Pesach and on the Zevach. The Zevach, most people think it means the Chagiga. Some people say it might actually even mean the Rashbam adds that some say that it might actually be including also voluntary offerings that one might be eating that night also. Now there's a blessing that you say, now it's a, what blessing do you say on the Pesach and what blessing do you say on the Zevach? We never really thought about this because we don't bring a sacrifice. But the Rashbam and Rashi say you make a bracha on, Rashi says, it's actually interesting. The Rashbam says, we each have a different version. If you remember way back when we had a whole debate, do you say lechol or liva'er or albi'or? Anyway, there's a whole debate about that. Interesting that Rashi and Tosfot each have, a, uh, Rashi and Rashbam have a different version of the blessing, but they both agree that it's a blessing on the eating of it. So just like you say, and which we're going to do later this week, but there also you say a bracha on eating it. Some people actually say that, no, we're talking about a bracha on slaughtering the animal. In, okay, not eating, but let's just assume it's eating right now. So Rabbi Ishmael says that if you made a bracha on the Pesach, it exempts the zevach, it exempts the sacrifice. In other words, if you didn't make a bracha on the Chagiga and you made it on the Pesach, that covers you for both. But if you made a blessing on the zevach, on the Chagiga, or maybe voluntary offerings on eating them, lo patarat shal Pesach. That doesn't cover your Pesach. Rabbi Akiva Omer, lo zo poteret zo, lo zo poteret zo. This sounds a little bit to me like our mitzvot mevat lo zo et zo. When we had that whole discussion, we talked about each mitzvah stands alone. These are two separate things. Now it's true. The Chagiga was eaten, if you remember, so that you'd eat the Korban Pesach al hasova, so that you're satiated when you eat it, so that you're not eating like a very hungry poor person or something, but you have it. So the way kings eat, it was one of the reasons given. Another was that you don't break the bone because you're trying to get the marrow out because you're so hungry. So in any case, he says, no, these are two totally different things, even though they somewhat go together, but one is a Chagiga and one is a Pesach and one can't, one can't exempt the other. The Gemara goes into this and tries to understand. Keshetim Salomer, if you look better into things, you'll see that Ledivre Rabbi Ishmael Zrika bichlal shvicha, velo shvicha bichlal zrika. Okay, you might be saying, where are we going with this? Where do we get off on this? So he says that when you look at it now, even though this is an eating, you have to say that this relates back to the korban itself. Now, there's a few differences between the Pesach and the Chagiga. The korban Pesach was, the blood was spilled on the altar. Okay, what you do is you would spill it. There's a debate. Do you spill it? There's something called the Yisod HaMizbeach. Okay, which is this base at the bottom of the altar, which was on two sides, on the, on the west side and the north side. And it jutted out a teeny bit into the other two sides, but really it was on, went on two sides of the altar. And what you would do is some people say you would stand right by the base and you would pour into the base. Some people say you pour onto the wall of the altar and it would drip down into the base. So that's called shvicha. Zrika is, now both are done, by the way, the, the blood is in a utensil. As opposed to, I'll just give you another example, the chatat, you would, the Kohen dips his finger in the sin offering and he puts it on the four corners of the altar. This is different. The, the zrika is you take it from the utensil, the same thing as the yeso, but instead of pouring, you throw it. Okay, kind of, you can imagine, right? Again, Rabbani Leah is going to get later to the issues of korbanot and how we relate to this in general and how we take from this to our daily lives. But Let's just assume you can get over the fact that they're throwing blood, but they would throw it on the wall and then again, it would drip down into the Yisot. So the question is how similar are these two actions? So they say, according to Rabbi Ishmael, Zrika is included within Shvicha, but Shvicha is not included within Zrika. I thought this was interesting and I'm not gonna go off on this point. I'll go off on a different point soon, but the, the way we discussed in the beginning of the Mesechet, if you remember, I always like to connect back the end to the beginning, we talked about the whole language thing, or la arba'asa. Remember the whole is, or night is it day, and what's the language used here? Also, we're talking about language. When you use the word zrika, does that include shvicha or does it not? Zrika is a specialized way of putting the blood. Because it's a specialized way, it doesn't include shvicha. Shvicha is a more general term. The same way you have the bracha shahako, which can cover 
other things, right? It can cover everything, basically. It's your everything bracha, even though other brachot are more specialized. So shvicha can include zrika. Zrika can include shvicha. What does that have to do with anything? So the simple reading of this is that Pesach can be done bishvicha, the blood, but the shlamim that we talked about, the chagiga, has to be done with, with zrika. Therefore, if you can't, if you made the blessing for the, for the sacrifice of the chagiga, that can include the pesa. It's a very hard gemara to understand exactly how this connects, and I'm going to give you an alternate explanation in one minute. Ledivre Rabbi Akiva, if you look further into him, he thinks lo shvicha b'chal zrika v'lo zrika b'chal shvicha. Neither can include the other, and that's why you have to make a separate blessing on all. If you look in Tosfot, and I'm not going to read the whole thing inside, but he basically, I hope, otherwise we'll never finish today. The Tosfot covers the whole page, which is why this page is so short. But the point being, the Tosfot quotes the Yerushalmi. And Tosfot actually says that Rabbein Chaim, he says at the end, has a different version than ours. And, and he basically says that actually Shvicha includes Zrika and Zrika includes Shvicha. And the real issue is not that. The real issue is that what's the Ikar and what's the Tafel? And this is really a Brachot issue, right? If you're eating cereal and milk, so what blessing do you make? You make it on the cereal because the milk is secondary, right? Unless you think that the milk is the most important thing and you're eating cereal just so you have milk, right? Then it, it all depends on what your perspective is. So what he, what the, the way the Yerushalmi, and on the basis of that, Rabbi Chaim explains our Gemara, which is that what it really means here, the Pesach can include your Chagiga because the Chagiga is only coming to serve the Pesach. The only purpose for bringing those Chagigot, the, that Korban Chagiga, is to allow you to eat the Pesach ala Sova. So if there is no, if you don't need that, then you're not, right? If you, if, I'm sorry, if you have the Chagiga, that can include the Pesach because According to Rabbi Ishmael, it goes by what's important and what's secondary. So the Chagig is clearly secondary to the Pesach. Moving on. Rabbi Simla, we are Rabbi Simla, Ikla Lepidyon Haben. Okay, we all of a sudden end with the story, always nice to end with the story. He shows up at a Pidyon Haben, which by the way, relates to Pesach because the Bicholim were saved, the firstborns, and because of that, we redeem the firstborns. They give money to a Kohen. Baumine. So while he shows up to this pidyon aben, classic, you know, rabbi walks into a pidyon aben and he starts getting asked a halachic question. Pshita al pidyon aben, asher kdesham tzav tzivanu, al pidyon haben, avi haben mevarech. It's clear who makes the bracha on the pidyon aben, that's the father of the child who's being redeemed. But, baruch shechiyanu v'kiyamanu v'hiyanu lazman hazeh, kohei mevarech, o avi haben mevarech. This is a really interesting question. Why, why would you even think that the father wouldn't make a shechianu, right? Isn't it his pidyon aben? And the, what the, he's asking is maybe the, co, the coin who gets the money makes it because he's making money off the deal. That's, what do we make shechianu on? We buy new clothes. Now, first of all, this is strange if you compare it. So what are you going to say? If you buy new clothes, whoever sold you the clothes made money off the deal, so they should make a shechianu. Right? Nobody ever suggests that. That would be strange. So what's going on here exactly? So first of all, there's one difference between the example I gave of clothing and this example, because the pidyon aben, as you're doing the mitzvah, the mitzvah is to give the money, right? When you're, when you're um, saying shechianu on new clothes, you're saying and I'm wearing the new clothes at that moment, you're not giving the money to anybody else. So it's not really a fair comparison. But there's a thought that maybe the Kohen who gets the money is blessing because he's benefiting from this mitzvah by getting a financial reward. So maybe he should make the blessing. So Kohen mevarech de kamate hana ali is it the Kohen because he benefits? Oh, avia ben mevarech de ka'avid mitzvah, or is it the father because he's doing the mitzvah? Well, let's see what Rabbi Simai answers. Lo hava biyade, he had no idea. Or he didn't, maybe he had no idea, but he didn't know how to answer. Maybe it never occurred to him, I don't know. He'd never been to a pidyon ben, it's strange, he didn't know. Atashel ben midrasha, so what does he do? This is great. He goes into the Beit Midrash and he asks, what, what do we do? Amru le, they said to him, Avi ben shtayim, avi ben shtayim. Says the father makes both brachas and that's what we passed in. That's the halacha. Some people, by the way, explain the coin also makes a bracha. And the real question here is, what if both want to make the bracha and one wants to be mozi the other? If, if they're both there and they both, one wants to just say, well, I'll say it and you answer amen. Who's better to say the bracha? Then they say the coin, and that maybe makes more sense why maybe 
Ravi Singh, I never thought of this question because maybe it's just a matter of, right? Normally they both really need to, but if one wants to get the other's obligation filled, then he can do it for him. Anyway, I wanted to make sense of the three, the, the different topics that we saw today, the Pigal and the Notar and the Chashtay Kuna, and then, you know, putting it into categories, the Berkat Pesach, you know, the Ikar and Tafel, and this issue of this Brachan Pidyon Abena, what do these have to do with each other? So I thought about this and how does it connect to the Homo Sefet? That what's happening in these sections are we're categorizing mitzvot here. We're saying where do things fit in, right? Everything's putting it to its category. Now, why is categorization so important? And why are these details? We're ending with all these details. And I thought about the Korban Pesach in general, or Pesach. The first commandment we really get, other than Puru that was given to Adam Arishon and, and um, Brit Milah to Avraham and Gidan Asheba Yaakov, other than our first mitzvah is HaChodesh Hazel Lechem. And the first thing God starts to do when he tells us that is give us a whole list of details, right? Till the extent, you know, don't break a bone in the carbine and all sorts of details that seems like, wow, you know, and, and anyone learning Gemara knows that there's a lot of details. And sometimes we get bogged down by the details and it's complicated. And, and you wonder, why are we getting into all these details? And I think what's going on here is they're showing you these details are details. And yes, it's a lot, a lot of details, but it's important to categorize things and put them the details allow us to be able to categorize things. And I thought about this when you look at our Masechet, that we really learned, and, and one of the beauties of learning Dafyomi is that you have the ability to, yes, get into all the details, but also look from the back and, and take, a, take a broader look at the whole Masechet and what we've learned all this time. And it's the details. I talked about this specifically recently about the Haggadah, that in the Haggadah also, there's main central parts and there's less central parts, right? How many people have been to a Seder where by Hallel, you've already lost a lot of people because we've gotten carried away with other things and half the table maybe doesn't even say Hallel. And Hallel, as we learned, is very basic to the Haggadah. So in learning, what we learn is what's important, what's Tafel and what's Ikar, in the words of what Tosfa brought from the Yerushalmi. And that's what it's really learning is all about is, yes, we're involved in all these details, but all these details enable us to have a much better understanding of our traditions and, and what's the basic and what's you know, added on or less essential, which helps us to better understand what we're doing. So with that, we will do the Hadrons. Um, so everybody open up to the Hadrons. Hadron alach arvei psachim, a psachim uslika lach mesechet psachim. With that, we end our chapter and we end our mesechet. So we'll say it together. The Hadron, Hadron alach mesechet psachim v'hadra chalan. We're gonna say this section three times for those who this is new to you. Um, so Hadron Alach Mesechet Psachim Bahad Rachalan, Dat Hanalach Mesechet Psachim Vidat Achalan, Lone in Nashem Minach Mesechet Psachim, the Lot in Nashem Minan, Loba Alma Hadem, the Loba Alma de Ate. Hadron Alach Mesechet Psachim Bahad Rachalan, Dat Hanalach Mesechet Psachim Vidat Achalan, Lot in Nashem Minach Mesechet Psachim, the Lot in Nashem Minan, Loba Alma Hadem, the Loba Alma de Ate. Hadron Alach Mesechet Psachim Bahad Rachalan, Dat Hanalach Mesechet Psachim, Vidat Achalan, Lot Nashem Inach Mesechet Psachim, Velot It Nashem Inan, Loba Alma Haden, Veloba Alma Daate. That means we're going to return to you and we will learn you again. So for the next cycle. Yehi Ratzom of Hanecha, Adonai Elohenu, Velahea Votenu, Shetehe, Toratcha Umanutenu, Baolam Haze, Utehe Manu, Laolam Haba, Hanina Bar Papa, Rami Bar Papa, Nachma Bar Papa. Achai bar papa, Abamari bar papa, Rachman bar papa, Rachish bar papa, Surcha bar papa, Ada bar papa, Davu bar papa. Ha'arev na Adonai Eloheinu et ivrei Toratcha befinu ufipiyot amcha beit Yisrael v'diye kulanu anachnu v'tetzeinu v'tetzei amcha beit Yisrael kulanu yodei shemecha v'lomdei Toratcha. Me'evai techakmeni mitzvotecha ki la'olam hi li. יהי ליבי תמים בחוקך, למען לא אבוש, לעולם לא אשכח פיקודיך, כי בם חייתני, ברוך אתה אדוני למדני חוקך, אמן, 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 סלע ועד. יהי רצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהי ואלוהי, אה אלוהי, כשם שעזרתני לסיים מסכת פסחים, כן תעזרנו להתחיל מסכתות וספרים אחרים, ולסיימם ללמוד וללמד, לשמור ולעשות ולקיים, את כל דברי תלמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והאמוראים ותלמידי חכמים 
יעמוד לנו ולזרענו שלא תמוש התורה מפינו ומפי זרענו עד עולם. ויתקיים בנו בהלכך תנחה אותך, בשופחה תשמור עליך, בהקיצותה היא תשיחך. כי בי ירבו ימיך ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים, אורך ימים בימינה, שמאלה אושר וכבוד, אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן, אדוני יברך את עמו בשלום. Congratulations to everyone, Mazal Tov.